Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Where are you tuning in from? Use the chat and let us know where you are. Suzanne is in Toronto. I'm in Seattle. Cherie's in Oakland. Where are you? I'm going to have to put my glasses back on because I can't see the screen now. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting making like weird shadows on my face, but I think this is probably better that I can actually read. All right, we'll let a few more people get tuned in and then we will get started. All right. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington. It's called Book Larder. We have just started to do a few in-person author talks and classes again, um, but we are continuing to do these lovely Zoom talks, which allow talks like the one we're doing today to happen, where um, I can be in Seattle and Cherie can be in Oakland ready to do the interview, and our author Suzanne is in Toronto. I mean, what? When would that ever happen otherwise? Um, and you can be wherever you are. And we've had, um, we know people join us from all over the US and all over the world. So thank you for joining us. We are recording the conversation today and it will be on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, another sort of housekeeping item is that we have enabled live um, transcription for the talk for the, uh, those that that's helpful for. If you want to turn it off or control where it is on your screen, you can do that from the little live transcript button that you will find on your screen. All right, we are so happy to welcome Suzanne Barr today. She is a Toronto-based chef and now author, author of this wonderful book, My Aki Tree. This is the advanced reader copy that I have because I couldn't wait to read it. So I've had this since December. Um, the actual book is hardcover. It has this lovely cover, but it is hardcover. Um, Suzanne will be in conversation with Cherie Williams. She is the founder, executive director, publisher, editor at the Global Food and Drink Initiative in Oakland. And they are going to talk about the book. I will put a link to it in the chat so that you can um, purchase a copy if you'd like. Suzanne um, very generously sent us book plates, so you'll actually get a signed copy. And um, they will also leave time for questions. So please use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have questions for Suzanne, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. All right, so I'm gonna turn things over now to Cherie Williams and Suzanne Barr. Awesome, awesome. well, thank you, Laura. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and thank you, Suzanne, for thinking of me um, for hosting this interview, because we've got a lot to talk about, which I'm very excited about. And so congratulations, first and foremost, on the book. Congratulations, thank you. because thank you. I know a lot of work went into it. Um, and so I'm excited to dive into it, if you don't mind. So we can Absolutely. No, it's a pleasure um, to be here. And um, I want to first just welcome and honor all of our ancestors that have been here presently before us and share this land and this conversation as we bring their, their names forward. And um, thank you, Cherie, for being available. I mean, it's been a couple years, several years since we last spoke, and it's, a, it's an honor to be back with you again. Awesome, awesome. And so speaking of that, it was actually 2017 that we did our interview for Cuisine Noir. And for everyone out there sort of to set that date and time, um, you had was on just closing Saturday Dinette and Kit Chocolate was coming into the picture. But what I like about the book that I did not know that if you, if anyone knows your work from those restaurants, this book takes a deeper dive into your life. And it's like, whoa, it is definitely a page turner um, because you learn so many things about you that obviously you wouldn't know from just ordering your food and things like that. And so I want to start off, you talk about your mom and your dad and you share that story. And it's a beautiful story from beginning to end. And then it ends with those recipes. But let's talk about your mom because she definitely plays a role. And you talk about how she lived in Jamaica until she was 12. She went from London and then from London to Canada. Tell us a little bit about your mom. Uh, yeah, 
Eunice Adasia Basie Barr. She was truly my best friend. Um, we spent so much time together, you know, before I left to go to, to college in New York. Um, you know, we had our years, I think like most of my teenage years where we struggled to understand and for each other to give each other space and time and to honor where she was coming from and what she was hoping for me. And then what I was hoping to, to, to create and to do for myself as this young, you know, woman coming into myself and coming into what I thought would be the best life, you know, the best years of my life, you know, 19, 20 and into her twenties. Um, she was an artist. She was a lover of music and dance. She loved to cook when she could just do whatever she wanted to. Um, she loved to bake. She loved sweets. She always had like a candy in her purse, whether it was a Kit Kat bar or a piece of gum. <laughs> she was a thinker. She was a quiet woman. She kept to herself about a lot of things. And those, those stories that I never heard are the stories that I then later had to find out through siblings and through some of her deep, her longest, dearest friends. And in the process of writing this book, I had an opportunity to contact them and to sit down and listen to their stories about her, this woman, this young mom that was pregnant at the age of 18, and then her journey of leaving Jamaica, then going to England to this cold, dark, new country, and what it felt like for her. And um, then moving to Canada, and then another cold country, and you know, more, you know, ch changing of her life and leaving her family, but finding her family again. And then to, you know, eventually move down to South Florida to the US. You know, my mom has always been, you know, someone I've admired and I've respected, but I think this book gave me the, the, the real foundation of understanding everything she went, had gone through and those stories that, you know, I think she held back because, you know, mothers try to protect their daughters as long as they can. And I know she's still protecting me even in her absence from my day to day. Awesome. You know, when you tell someone's story, I always say, especially when we talk to a lot of chefs and business owners, it's not a clear cut path, right? You obviously started off going to cut to, you know, in New York, you worked for MTV, you were a fashion stylist. I mean, all of these things that you did um, but through your book, you draw that beautiful line of from the beginning to where you are now. So share a little bit about that journey um, of from, you know, being able to go back and recount that time, because you share some really personal stuff, right? In the book. <laughs> so you, you share some really personal stuff, but again, it all made you who you are. Yeah. Share a little yeah. bit about that journey. Um, you know, my writing partner, Suzanne Hancock, and I, you know, I, I feel like I have to start there because Starting with Suzanne is really kind of my entrance into understanding like how this book came to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I had begun a, um, a chef in residence at a hotel in Toronto and Suzanne and I first met when she had a, she has a podcast called Sunday Night Dinners. And when we first met, she was like, I want you to make something that you would have enjoyed on a Sunday night dinner mm -hmm. with your family. And we made my mother's apple pie. Mm -hmm. That relationship, explode just just blossomed you know the same name we had very similar stories you know um and yet at the same time we were very different women doing very similar deep dives into our our, our own stories of our life and, and and our families and when she approached me about writing about you know a book a cookbook is what we initially thought we were going to do and then presenting this book proposal to to Penguin and then them saying, we want more. And then going through that history, going through my memory, which is like, you know, at 45 years, I want to say it's still pretty good, but like <laughs> there are a lot of years that I kind of felt like I blocked out. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of those years that I for wanted to forget about, nice. but I found and I remembered them and I put them in the book because I think it's important for people to understand that we all have some path that we have gone through to get us to where we are, 
And there were moments and times where I'm like, gosh, I wish I would have not done that because maybe I would have done something else. But I think after writing this book and going through and remembering and, you know, literally Suzanne and I wrote, we had like a timeline of, of like my life. Like she was like, okay, what's the earliest memory you have? Wow. And then we went through and, you know, last week I had a conversation with Lisa Donovan, another fellow chef and author. And she was like, was there any similarity in, in the way that you design a menu to the way that you wrote this book? And I said, the one similarity that really shared with me is like the process of like writing it out. You know, we jotted everything that I could remember from my first job to my last job to opening the restaurant every single moment. Mm -hmm. And I went back and remembering, you know, those those little details and closing my eyes and 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 taking a lot of waking up really early in the mornings to kind of think about those details, those those finishings, the chair, the colors, the smells, the music, the things that really resonated me that took me, transported me right back to that moment. And that is what helped me to kind of go that far back. And and yeah, there was a lot of fear there. I was nervous and, you know, didn't understand like, is this important? But I think that's the one thing in in having a writing partner like, you know, having Suzanne, it was like, I, I spilled everything and then we were able to work with our editor and carve and mold and make this into the story it needed to be. Wow. Wow. That is just amazing. Wonderful. Just amazing. Was there any part of the book? Well, let me ask you this. When did you start working on the book? Yeah. So we started this book like two and a half years, you know, ago, you know, now it's probably three years at that point, at this point, you know, at, you know, I was on my way out of, you know, my position as executive chef at the, of this hotel. Mm-hmm. And we started to, you know, figure out the details and we started to draw some comparisons. And, and then I was opening up True True Diner and then I was opening another project. So I had a few projects on the line. So it's, you know, like hurting chefs to organize us to do things is always like a struggle because we're so busy. And multitasking is a, is a gift that we sh- all share, but it's also a distraction when it's something where we know we have to sit down and we can't do anything else. And, and writing is just that, right. you know, I had to wake up four or three hours earlier than my whole family to be able to get secure quiet time mm-hmm. so that I could write and that I could think and I could cry and I could jot down those notes and I could build the story and share that with Suzanne and then Suzanne would take that and she would mold and then she would send it back to me. And we had this beautiful bond and and way of just creating the story and telling the story and honoring my mother and my family's work and their lives and and everyone that I worked with. It's, um, it was a process. So tell us about the inspiration behind the title. Yeah, so (laughs) I like to say that the title actually came a little later, you know, and we had secured a, another title that we were very excited about. Um, and that title was like, we were like, yes, this is it. This feels right. And then it was maybe a few months before we were going to like send it to print. And we got some feedback from the marketing team at Penguin and they were like, eh, we're not sure about this title. And we were kind of, you know, thrown in, you know, in, in the grip of like, what do we do now? Like we were so set on this title, but you know, it, it showed me that the real title hadn't really been decided yet. And, you know, my Aki tree represents, you know, my family's honoring of our flag, you know, Aki and saltfish is the national dish from Jamaica Mm -hmm. out my front bedroom window in my house that I grew up in plantation, Florida is an Aki tree that my dad and my mother planted when we bought the land to build that house. Wow. That Aki tree still stands there. That Aki tree produces some of the most beautiful and delicious and amazing Aki year after year. I'm so grateful to be able to have, you know, honored, you know, the beginning of our family in that, you know, in that house with the title of this book, because it feels like it just kind of landed where it was supposed to. You know, that first title felt so real. It felt so like, yes, 
but Mayaki tree is exactly what it, the name was, should have been and was always going to intend it to be. So I'm grateful to get to have gotten there. Well, we have, we have someone that says, can you disclose what the original title was by any chance? <laughs> yeah, so the original title was called Homecoming. Oh. And I called it, we called it Homecoming because just thinking about we going, going back home to really feeling connected to the roots. And, you know, when I moved back to Toronto after living in the U.S. for so many years and then moving back to Toronto and finding my, you know, my, my love, my restaurant, having my son, it was our homecoming. Right. Saturday Dinette was our homecoming and being back there. So for me, it just like, that was like, yeah, that's it. But um, Aki Tree relates on so many levels. I mean, we look at the titles of each chapter and we, we reson the resonation of all of the proverbs and how the proverbs are part of, you know, my memories of my grandmother saying some of these to me and, and my aunties sharing with me like, you know, this cheese shy like Chesha Cat and all these little terms and, <laughs> and the endearment and the love and the culture that is so deep rooted and it's just, it goes back so far um, as far as, you know, farther than I have even researched and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to explore and understand more about my heritage and my culture. But this is my first step in and I don't think I'm planning to stop anytime soon. And so speaking of that, in the book, you definitely touch on some points where culture, food, and language sort of came out, right? So some of the things I remember, you, I believe it was your mother that says, you're not Jamaican, you're Canadian, right? And then therefore, you know, we're not speaking Patois at home, we're speaking English. And then noting in school of, you know, how you talked, right? Like a, a white girl, you know, so were you black enough, white enough? What was that like, you know, being a Jamaican, doing this identity? And then you also, as you got older, you, you mentioned when you were doing a private chef gig and someone, you were taking care of someone, I believe from South Africa. And, and he said, you remind me of the maids, our maids in South Africa. Yeah. Tell me about childhood and then you're experiencing things as a black woman, a black Jamaican woman in your adulthood. Tell us a little bit about that. And again, that just shapes again who you are. And like you said, just honoring your culture. Yeah. You know, growing up being, you know, someone that could relate to the fact that I, in my house with my parents and my sister and my brother, we were Jamaican. I mean, from the good oil on the stovetop to the provisions, to, to, to the constant ackee coming in, bun and cheese constantly around, curry in the fridge, like those defining elements of our culture and our heritage and our food and the music and, and the language was so defined. It was so in the house. It was so ingrained. It was a part of us. It was never a question of who and where our parents came from. We knew, but there was also this struggle with the fact that I was born in a, in a very different place than where we currently lived. And so outside of the confines and the comforts of my home would, would start the, the, the conversation is, well, where are you from? Mm -hmm. Like, you're not from like Georgia, you're not from, you're not black American, then what are you? Well, I'm not Jamaican because I wasn't born there and I'm not allowed to speak Patois because I don't represent the language. I can't speak the native tongue because I am, was not born the, of the native tongue, but yet I don't relate to a country that is so far and so distant, but it's so innately a part of me because I was born on that land. But how does that land connect to me when I don't even know my heritage there? Is my heritage there? My family's there, but are my roots there? No, my roots are in Jamaica. And so this was like, a constant, you know, struggle for me growing up, you know, especially when there were the years where in the 80s and 90s growing up in South Florida, you know, being Jamaican wasn't cool enough at that time until certain artists and musicians that made it, you know, appealing. People were like, oh, fashionable to wear, you know, 
the Rastafarian colors and to have representation of Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Bouja Bantan, Capleton, anybody that was coming out musically that was making a name and that was representing Jamaica as this like beautiful, loud, proud cultural people that then it became acceptable to be like, yeah, I'm Jamaican. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's also being that we went to a school that was predominantly white and Jewish for pretty much my whole, you know, education. I went to the same school from elementary, middle and high school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my friends were a mixture of Black Americans, Black Haitians, Canadians, Africans. I mean, we were a mashup, a melting pot, all immigrants, all trying to figure out who we were and how to identify to then leaving and going to New York and my first life experience of being on my own to someone saying, who are you and where are you from? And why do you sound that way? You're from Florida, what? Like connect the dots, make sense of, and I myself was trying to make sense of it all mm -hmm. to then taking this first job and constantly being reminded that you are not where you think you're from and who are you? and where are you from is was this constant question mm -hmm. and you find it in the book that a, a lot of questioning always always resonated for me because i was trying so hard to find a place that felt right that felt like it it meant that i had belonged i was constantly you know you know fitting in when i could you know sliding in through music sliding in through my my just like making friends very easily, you know, cooking was something that it didn't, you know, it, it allowed me to immediately just tell a story of just rejoicing by eating something yummy and good. And I didn't need to ask to answer the question of where you're from. Right. It was just, you can cook. That food is good. <laughs> so, wow. And so now, and so tell us how that plays out on your plates that you put today, your menus. How, how does this all play out? You know, it plays out in so many different ways. I mean, the project that I'm currently working on, <laughs> I like to say that it's probably the most far from the food that I've made in, in years because it's offering German food. Now, I don't have German roots, but I did spend some time in, in the area in, in, in Berlin. And I spent some time in other places in the South living in Georgia. I spent time in... Denmark, I spent, you know, I've, I've traveled, I've lived, I've been exposed, I've been, you know, romanced, I've been, you know, so, th so privileged to be able to have a span of, of places and spaces and books and music and sounds and, and smells and scents and, and, and textures that all bring me to a place of how can I put that on a plate? Mm -hmm. And the way that I do that is really by connecting, you know, storytelling with, with, with food. I connect that with storytelling, with food, with places that I've been to and things that I remember and like, oh, I had that one time where I was in Hawaii, but I want to make it a little different. I don't have that same ingredient, but I have this ingredient so I can make it this way. It's been a privilege to be able to to, to, to tap into that side of myself as an artist. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, I didn't ever call myself an artist because I was just like, well, you know, I just, you know, food, cooking food. Yeah, everybody cooks, right? But I think understanding that not everybody cooks with the same passion that you have, Suzanne. Right. And what makes your food so distinct and so important for you and for anyone that gets a chance to, to that you get to connect with and share with is that it's your voice, it's your perspective, it's the colors, it's it's the memory. And a lot of my memories are filled with so many, so many magical places and, and, and people that have inspired me, including my mom and my dad and you know, my countless, you know, folks that I've worked with, my teams that I've, you know, worked with them and they've shared with me their their love of food and I got inspired by the the things they've told me to the places that I've traveled to. So it all plays out. So, so, you know, I guess dish to dish, it's always changing. It's always changing, truly. 
that. I like that. Now, having so much experience being a private chef, opening restaurants, working for others, your work around advocacy, because obviously you've been, you, you have, are able to see the industry, see what is going on. Share a little bit about that, the work that you're passionate about around advocacy for the industry and individuals. You know, I didn't ever really want to go into this industry. This wasn't something that I, I think I grew up planning or thinking about, you know, but one thing I can say that I always had an innate love and, 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 and a connection to was being able to call things out when things don't feel right. Mm -hmm. To be able to use my camera, my pen, something to be able to speak out when something doesn't feel right or someone isn't being treated in a way or if I'm not feeling like my, that I'm not communicating what I actually want to say. You know, I started out shooting photographs because my dad was a photographer and my camera became my first tool. The first tool that I ever was able to capture the true moments that were presented to me that shared with me of whether it was someone smiling, someone crying, someone just in the, just caught in that moment. And I used that tool to capture that. Now, eventually when I got myself back to, you know, understanding that cooking was, was another way that I really loved and understood was really when I was taking care of my mother. Mm -hmm. And as she was sick and I came back home to take care of her, you know, understanding that this time that we share is going to be so important. It's going to take an, it's going to take a part of me that I'm going to probably not understand how far back it's going to lay some effects on me. I had to pull from the depths that I didn't even know, accepting and understanding that moms do die. Mm. Mothers weren't, aren't supposed to leave daughters. They're mm. supposed to be with us and show us and guide us. You know, after she passed away, it was kind of like me recognizing that there was something more to what I was doing with my life. Okay. You know, attending the Million Women's March was, was a major shift in my life. Attending a women's um, movement march in DC was another moment where I understood that I was, you know, my message and my intention with anything that I wanted to do moving forward had to be, it was bigger than me. All of this was bigger than me. Me being by my mother's side and understanding what she needed and I couldn't understand exactly in the moment what she needed to eat, that was intentional to get me to this path. Right. So by the time I got to Toronto and opened up Saturday Dinette, there was something that was really driving me to connect with the next generation of women in kitchens. Mm -hmm. Seeing the disparity, seeing the systemic issues around women in kitchens, black women and in, in work, you know, women in, 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 as mothers trying to raise families, but also trying to define, keep at defining yourself and in, in, in who we can be and who we are constantly being asked to be. Mm -hmm. So all of this advocacy I feel like it wasn't advocacy at first. It was just me just, just plowing forward and me making sure that everything I did was intentional and that whether I was going to impact one person, two or three, it didn't matter. Yeah. That my reasoning to open up this restaurant with a small team of young women that had little to no experience and that we would work together to open this restaurant together, that was the initiative, that was the intention. Wow. This wasn't about me opening up a restaurant and my ego being like, I got my own restaurant. Like mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. never been the case for me. You know, I, I deter away from when people say, oh my gosh, you're a I'm like, I am glad to be able to do what I do every day because I love my work. But more than I loving my work is I love that I can use my work as a way to continue to spread and educate people about things that are most that are most affecting folks right now, food access, land in you know having more land and and, and owning land again, mm -hmm. growing your food, 
you know, understanding, you know, mental health in the industry, understanding an industry that is crippled in the last two and a half years, and that we're all trying to find meaning. But all of these silver linings, all this innovation that's happening, and all this inspiration that is coming, but all of this hardship and all of the struggle that we've been dealing through, this is all that is is been driving me even through the mud of it all. Because I've been, we've been all been trotting and and trekking through, mm -hmm. but it has. We all feel like th this is all for. It wasn't just for nothing. There's there's definitely something on the other side of this that's coming, and we're starting to see those lights and those shining moments where okay, this is why this is needed to happen. Wonderful, wonderful. So as you take us through this beautiful story, we get to the recipes. Share a little bit about the recipes that you shared with us, how many you had to take out, all that good jazz. You know, the recipes was really because I was very committed that I, regardless of the fact that we were making a memoir, I needed to share some food because some of the most magical moments for me when I was dreaming of food and dishes happened in the kitchen. So the biggest part of what made this story and this, you know, this journey come together was from the food, the food and how it affected people and how it affected me, how it changed me, how I found myself again through food, how I taught myself about myself through food and how all of these recipes are a combination of dishes that I've made while my time at the Gladstone Hotel, um, when I first did my an old Jamaican menu that was written in a love letter to my mother called the Rite of Passage. And, you know, some of these dishes are a bit more complex to make, but not to fret about the com uh, any of that, because I, I tell anyone that's reading the book, read the recipe from, from each ingredient to then the directions and know that it's a step-by-step -step process. Right. You know, this book is, it's not a thick book. You know, it's, a, it's almost a quick, nice, steady read, you know, and I felt that that was also important to, you know, not everything is in it, but a good amount of my life is in there. Mm -hmm. But holding back a bit was important also to like to remind you that we always have more to tell, but we don't need to put it all out right now. Mm -hmm. So I've left you with 12 recipes to get your your at your 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 palate a little wet mm -hmm. and a little bit excited about maybe it, we can go someplace and taste your food mm -hmm. and to get you up possibly on a plane or to drive and come in and eat some of my food in one of the projects that I might be working on. You know, and so I, you know, I always tell, tell folks, like, if you're looking for a recipe to start with from the book, mm -hmm. start with Nicey's apple pie, because that's what was, that was the first recipe that kind of set me and Suzanne on this journey together. Nice, nice. Well, we've got a question here. Let me go to the <laughs> Q&A. We got from Therese Nelson, our good friend up in New York here. Hey, Wonderful. Therese. Yes. She says, I'm thinking a lot about the way that the global culinary, and I can't see, Zeogeist, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, is making room for Af the African diaspora and chefs with clear food language. I wonder if you could talk about the level of progress you're, you've seen in Canada, particularly in regard to the pos uh, position of Caribbean cuisine. Uh, incredible question. And I think, sh I'm sure you and I were talking a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, what, you know, being back in Canada after the last 10 years, and from when I started to right, you know, being where I'm at right now, the scene has like exploded. Mm -hmm. And when I say exploded in the sense that there is this care factor and this this compassion to hold on to some of these incredible recipes. There have been, you know, cuisines that maybe you would hear stories about, you know, you would hear of the rumblings of recipes. You would hear more region, you're now hearing more about regional dishes that aren't just saying, okay, this dish is from 
this country, and this represents this whole cuisine. Now it's like, no, we're talking about a specific region mm -hmm. of food that comes from this area that is more closer to the water. And so there's more seafood or there's more, or we're near the land, so there might be more vegetables, whatever it might be. And I think there's like this influx of regional specific cuisines that are making a crazy impact on the, and the, on the cuisine. And it's not limited to just the big cities, Vancouver, Toronto, even Montreal. These are food mecca cities that people know and they travel there specifically for. But this is, these are cities that are, you can go and chances are you're gonna find some of the best, most talented cooks and, and teams that are doing it. But you can go into other cities now, you can go into smaller cities and you're seeing, you know, folks that are creating menus, they're creating moments, they're creating um, um, experiences that are so specific for them. They're not, we, they're not, a, they're not caught up in the fact that they needed to be in some big city for their food to make it, you know, to get it recognized. Their food is being appreciated. You know, um, there is, there's endless stories that have not been told within the African Caribbean diaspora. And we can relate that to the story of the Commonwealth and how our, our movements have been nonstop. And we see now that the Commonwealth and is, is breaking down. Countries are now deciding we want our independence from the queen's hand. We no longer need that dependency. And with that freedom that's breaking off and, and, and really imposing and taking a strong stance on we are, we are celebrating this, our, our, our country for who we are. We want to stand up on our own feet. We want to represent our food. We want to represent our music, our culture, our, her our heritage. And all of these things for me, I think are just, they're all part of like this major shift and change that is coming. And cuisine is, you know, I think when we talk about food, food is always that first way to kind of inject a new conversation of what's happening. Because you know, the best way to get to anybody is through a plate of food. Mm -hmm. And if you want to change something, you want to enlighten somebody on how and where to eat, make them a damn good plate of food. And you know, they're going to come running and they're going to tell everybody that they know. And then everybody's going to show up and they're going to be like, oh, okay. That's what we, we weren't getting this before, wow. but now we are. <laughs> nice. And so speaking of that, where do you see the future of Caribbean cuisine going? And, and where chefs are taking it to. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, you know, I think that Caribbean food is like, it's, it's, it's incredibly on the rise. I think it's, you know, from watching it on TikTok to Instagram, to Snapchat, any of the social, social feeds and ways of, of getting people fed are understanding that it's, we are not just we are not defined by the food that you think you know that come from that particular country. Right. Yep. You are going to expect jerk chicken to come in this fashion, but how about jerk jackfruit? You know, mm. how about us giving you something that you've never had before? How about understanding that our cuisine is not limited to the stories that have been told or shared or your experience in going to this island on vacation and expecting like, oh, I'm going to get turned out by having this one dish that, you know, I've never had conch fritters, conch fritters, yes. But I think that this is, this is a moment and there's so much more that's coming of like this influx of, of Caribbean culture that has not been talked about. I think we're going to see way more countries that are going to be bumping up. It's going to be less about these food fads of like Northern Italian or, um, uh, or any particular, you know, European based cuisine that people are constantly, that we're used to, we know, and we have these high expectations for. I think people are going to be now seeing that Caribbean islands that we may not have known of a particular dish that we've ever had before are now making it on these, you know, best recipes or best dishes you should be looking out for, for 2022 or 2024 or 2027. Like, I think we're gonna continue to see more dishes. I think we're gonna also see the, the flow of the continent of Africa making its, its, its impact 
in such a way that where we can say, yeah, we've been telling y'all that this food all comes from a beautiful place and that it's not just like based on one country. It's not just based on what you think you're going to eat. We have been influenced through because we have brought this influence of our food for generations and we will continue to do that. We are not limited to the bandwidth that you think you wanna put us in, these little easy pods of thinking that our food is this way. Right. Korean food has limitless, endless possibilities. And I am just thrilled and excited to be that on the journey because I'm like, I'm ready. I'm so (laughs) ready. I'm ready to go Um, to the Caribbean and spend some time because I think that's the best way to do it is to, you know, to travel and to taste and to educate and to learn and to read, you know, pick up a book, mm-hmm. get outside of what you think you know and challenge yourself to something that you would can never imagine. And, you know, and just see that connection, especially between you, the Caribbean diaspora and the African diaspora, right? We were talking earlier about the story we recently did on a Ghanaian uh, producer of a hibiscus tea drawing that connection from Africa, West Africa, and then, but we know, but we have known it from Jamaica, right? And, and, but that story of how it traveled. The other thing I was saying is, you know, I was speaking to a chef in Kenya and I, you know, one of my favorite recipes to do is a stir fried cabbage, but I got that recipe from a Jamaican chef, but here she is doing it in Kenya, exact same thing, you know? So it, it, there's so many similarities. And then last year when I was in St. Thomas, I took a cooking class uh, from a woman who's from Guadalupe and we were doing fritters, cutfish fritters, yeah. you know? So it's all connected once you see our, our history and where, where we've come and, and the influence of, you know, coming from Africa and uh, yeah. landing in various parts of the diaspora where we are, so. You know, and it's subtle changes, it's subtle, you know, um, differences that make it them so distinct and so personal for that particular country. Right. But I think what's ultimately so important and, and, and governs us back to the question and the point is that we are all connected. And that, you know, when talking about Aki and where Aki originated from, we're talking about Western Africa you know, making its journey, you know, being in someone's hair and the seed and traveling, you know, across, you know, transatlantic and then coming and finding, you know, its roots every, you know, for the most part, most of the Caribbean islands have a version of Aki on the island, but Jamaica for, for all of its history, it was the one country that decided to make it our national dish, you know, mixing and having it, you know, sharing that with some salted cod Mm -hmm. salty cod that's coming from you know the northeastern coast of Canada you know and and then venturing to Portugal and then making its way down and salty cod being used as a way to punish those that were working in the fields in the in the Caribbean because they were like we don't want you eating the fish but they weren't feeding us so we the only thing that we could eat was this one thing that we were using to actually fertilize the soil the land So understanding that, you know, we are all connected and these connections start with food. They start with stories. They start with, you know, being it passed on. And you asked, you know, you made the the great point about, you know, each chef has their own distinct way. And, And when we think about like our families, like when I talk about like my family in the book, it's like understanding that my ancestors are you know maroons they are Taino they you know I've got all of that history there that we're all just scratching the surface so can you imagine if we actually really start digging a little bit deeper into our into our history Mm -hmm. and into our ancestors what we can uncover and how and why certain foods we we resonate more with us Mm -hmm. versus other foods and and how we want to we want to understand a bit more why these things are happening we want to understand maybe a bit more of like how the future is going to look and how we are going to be eating in the future. Because a lot of these, you know, these commodities that we've been used to are may, may not and probably will not be here. So connecting us back to some of these original ways of embracing food and memory and our, and our heritage might be a good, good way to enlighten ourselves about how and 
how we can share that with our to our generation and the next generation of our, of our family. Wow. Now, I know we've got another question. Um, who are some of the chefs that are really the ambassador of Caribbean cuisine? I know Chef Noel, who's up there in Canada with you. Yeah. I read down in Florida. He's pretty big. Who are some other chefs that we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, um, uh, a dear friend, Chef uh, Adrian Forte, his book, he's just come out with his first cookbook, comes out, I believe, next month. Um, he's doing a modern Afro-Caribbean cookbook. Um, uh, Chef Latoya Flagan, okay, she yeah. is, she has a catering company based in Toronto, dear friend, sister that is just crushing it. She, she has not stopped cooking from the beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but has been feeding so many folks. And if you get your hands on a plate of her food, you will understand why, oh. you know, and I always give so much respect and love to, to, to the real jerk which is one of our, our, you know, landmark restaurant that has one of the oldest restaurants, Jamaican restaurants in Toronto that's just been there for generations. And Lily and, and, and her and her family, they are able, they have a restaurant in Toronto, they have one uptown and the beaches, and then they have one in the UK. So, you know, being able to see that, that tradition, that family run restaurant, that even through all of the, the stories that she must have to share, wow. that they still continue to keep us fed and full of, of, of good Jamaican food and memories. I think it's important to pay homage to those that have been doing it yeah. and having conversations with yeah. her about how, you know, it, you know, the products that she once couldn't get access to and now she can get them and how people, you know, people are, that typically wouldn't be eating certain foods are like asking, for certain dishes, like, can I get some breadfruit? She's like, what you know about breadfruit? <laughs> wow, wow. What are some ingredients that we may not be aware of that we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, um, there's some actually, uh, recipe, there's some ingredients that I think some people are starting to tap into. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they should keep going. Uh, breadfruit, being one of them, okay. that is something for the plant-based lovers right now and non-plant-based lovers, understanding like that is so, it's such a versatile vegetable that you can do so much with, you know, and the way that you're handling it is it's charring the whole actual seed, like just putting it on the fire and letting it char down and then peeling it back and then utilizing it in any way you want it, whether you're going to braise it, um, sh uh, shred it, you can, you know, char it, you can grill it, you can fry it. There's so many different ways to enjoy breadfruit, something that I didn't always love growing up, but something that I, now as an adult, I really, really appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, Chocho is something that I think we'll see in, in a lot of Latin American cooking as well, but it's something that people kind of overlook and forget about. And it's very, the size, it, it looks, so. I think it's been called like the Chinese knuckle. And it's because, and it, it, that's probably very derogatory wrong, but the, it's, it's this, um, it looks almost like a pear and the base of it, the, the butt of it is like turned inward and then it's green. So you peel it back, you can use it, you can enjoy it fresh and raw, or you can enjoy it, you know, cooked and boiled or steamed. You know, the one thing about Caribbean food that I love so much is that we're constantly always incorporating vegetables in our diet. It's just, it's the root of, of how we eat. You know, meat just happens to be, whether it's goat or chicken or fish, happens to be these accompaniments but the base of our food and cuisine is really, truly vegetables. Um, and Chef Nina, who's joining us, said, you know, that it is plant-based. Yeah, our, our food is 100% plant-based. And then you like, oh, maybe I'll add some chicken into it. Maybe I'll add some goat. Maybe I'll add some, you know, cow foot, you know, whatever that might be. But at the end of the day, it is plant-based. And it's so much that has to do with what's coming off that island, what's being grown on the island, what we can get access to, um, what's happening on the island, what's happening around the country, what's happening around, you know, surrounding islands. But I think just, you know, tr just exploring your grocery store now, which is a blessing that we're seeing that more people are 
we, ha we have some grocery stores are giving us more access to more uh, fruits and vegetables that you may have never heard of. Mm -hmm. And I always tell folks, pick up something new, go on an adventure, mm -hmm. look up the fruit or veg and give yourself a try. You know, like sometimes, you know, that's the best way to learn about how to cook something is to just to try it. Yep. You know, don't turn your nose up to it because you never know. You actually might really, really enjoy it. Edo's is another one, you know, a starchy, rooty root vegetable that I love to use, you know, replacing out your potatoes with some root vegetables for French fries, for mashes and things of that store. So, you know, kabucha squash is something that I love wow. and I'm constantly roasting it, pureeing it. I make a hummus from it. Yeah. There's so many different ways to embrace and enjoy the many vegetables that are coming from the Caribbean. So I challenge all of you that are with us today and later on to just have a great journey with it. Wow. So I've got a couple of fun questions as we get ready to wrap up. Name three ingredients that are always in your kitchen. I'm in my kitchen right now. <laughs> uh, okay, this is actually really good. Uh, Scotch bonnet, okay. ginger, and... In my, um, is my freezer also? Yeah. It's my, um, and in my freezer, I have green banana. Okay. All right. Those are good. I can dig those. I can dig yeah. that. Yeah. I can make a soup. I can make fritters. I can make a mash. I can, you know, I can make a hot sauce. But those are, those are my three must in my, in my house, in my fridge. Okay. okay. Uh, who is one person that you have yet to cook for that you would like to? Well, someone that I was really hoping to get this book to, and we're going to make sure we get this book to, is Michelle Obama. Okay, okay. Yeah, like I very much so would like to cook for, for the family. Um, you know, I've, I've had a chance to cook. Yeah, putting it out there. I've had a chance to cook for some, you know, for celebrities. And, you know, it's not something that I, you know, ever chased or, or felt inclined to continue. When I was a private chef, it was a time in my life where that work was happening. And I was very grateful for it. But that's something that I was like, okay, that that was great in my life. But now intentionally for to cook for people. Um, actually, yeah, so yeah, Michelle Obama has been on, on my list for some time. And and uh, yeah, I would love to just take her on a food journey and give her some flavors, maybe give her a little extra heat and see how she responds to it. <laughs> and I don't know if she, I haven't read if she likes heat or not. So I'm not sure where she lands on that spectrum of heat, so. Yeah, I don't know how she lands with heat, but I know she, she is appreciation and understanding and lover of food mm -hmm. and, you know, making sure that balanced diet and, and wellness is such a big part of our experience around eating. So I think she would totally dig any of the, the events that we do and you know something that we can say um, that we had the opportunity to do with her. Awesome. So we've got the book out. What's next? What are you working on as well? Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Um, honestly, there's a lot of little things that are that are happening, but I think the one thing I'm really excited about continuing to do is to be uh, Miles's mom. You know, like after closing my last project, True True Diner, I had not a lot of time with him. You know, like the beginning years of of Miles's birth, we had Saturday dinette, and as I tell in the book, like he was like always with someone else and that was hard for me you know as a mom because I felt like a part of my earliest memories of being a mom and being pregnant was like a lot of work and it was hard work so being able to be home now with him to make dinner to take him to soccer and whatever else he's doing that's something that I'm really cherishing um, but I am dipping my toes back into, you know, the idea of what it means to have a, a restaurant, but more on the, as a consulting. So as I said, I'm working on a project in Miami for a client of mine. Um, it's a restaurant down here. Um, I will not be in the kitchen cooking regularly, but I will be consulting on the menu and, you know, just building out a very, um, sustainable, uh, 
uh, restaurant concept that I, I'm really proud and excited about. And we'll, we, you know, hoping to have that out to the city of Miami before the end of the year. Um, and then I have, you know, the works of, of, of continuing to work. So I found my way back into the film industry. Okay. okay. So Savannah and I have- Bad boys, I saw that. Yeah, you know, it's like- Bad boys. Your first love is hard to, to kind of pass by and pass up. You know, my first love of film was was something that that really I, I always saw for myself. So now a little bit more TV opportunities are, are coming my way and also developing some TV concepts. I still think there is this untapped market of conversations, more conversations about food, folks of color, um, in kitchens, out of kitchens, not just kitchens, because I think we're transcending the idea that, you know, being a chef is not limited to just being in the kitchen cooking. I think we are transcending by, you know, defining what that needs to be a food, you know, anthropologist, you know, anthropologist, you know, a food, you know, um, a historian and understanding that there's way more conversations about that we can have with food where I'm not just cooking you, kicking a plate of food and then serving it up to you. So there's, there's a lot of work that I feel like as, you know, someone has a producer hat on that I can still impact some change, but from another, you know, um, realm of educating the masses and whether that takes me on a whole nother 360 to get back there, then that's what I had to do to get there. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Well, tell everybody where they can buy the book, where they can find you on social media. Yeah, so I can absolutely say that Book Larder, if you're in <laughs> Seattle and wherever else you are, that's where you need to be buying your books. Um, <laughs> we are we are selling it pretty much anywhere, but I 100% support local businesses. Please support your bookshops in your local neighborhoods. If they don't have my book, ask them. They will gladly order them. I would gladly send book plates to wherever you are located to get my book out to you. I think my book is um, the first of hopefully a few more stories to tell. And, you know, it's it's um, a pleasure to be here with y'all. You know, my social handle, whether it's on Instagram or uh, Twitter is Suzanne Bar Food. So please, you know, follow my journey, follow my stories. We are, you know, I've got some things in the, in the works and, you know, you'll be able to find out about whatever next I'm doing by show, following me on any of the threads. So thank you, Laura, for having us. This was yeah. so great. Oh, it was my pleasure. For, for it was my pleasure. Us. Such a lovely conversation. Thank you so much, Cherie for your insightful questions and thank you audience for all of your lovely questions as well the the chat was you know all full of support <laughs> she talked it was it was great um i wanted to ask you one quick question did you take photos in the book that are in the book i did i took so there's a shot of like my arms like yeah my yeah that i took and then um i think there's one more in there that i took but a lot of them or like my my dad's photos, yeah. my uncles, some photographer from England that shot my mom when she was like wow. 19 to wow. like uh, um, um, my dear friend, Sam Engel King, who is a talented photographer based in Toronto. He shot all of the food, food, for food mm -hmm. shots. And yeah, it's, it was such a, a, a love of bringing these images together, especially for me being a photographer you know, loving photos, it was hard to pick the, the best ones that really represented in the book. So I think we did all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially I love it when, um, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you, you sort of see your work as art. And I think this book definitely reflects that because it's the story told in such a creative style, the photos, the food, it's just, it's really delightful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Can't wait you know, to hear more of your story and watch it unfold. So thank you thank you thank you you know it's um like i said you know i think that this is this is definitely a, a, an interesting time for for anyone that's telling their story and, and as a as a black woman you know i feel honored to be able to just be one storyteller of the many that are that are telling their stories through writing through food 
through art, through dance, through whichever way that you're able to communicate and convey your mission and your story. So I am just honored to follow in the footsteps of the many that are doing this, this good, honorable work. And, and for those that will be able to pick this up and, and remember and, and to read and to, to learn a bit more. Yeah, well, we're very grateful that you've chosen to share it with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you everyone for tuning in. Like I said, we recorded this, so it'll be on YouTube. Um, I should be able to get it up tomorrow. So um, before the end of the day tomorrow, and we'll share it on socials everywhere. Um, stay safe and healthy, everyone. Suzanne, good luck with everything. Sheree, thank you again. Yeah. And um, have a lovely evening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.